history first. Your first album, the first album of yours that I bought was was the Ramblin' album that you did way back then for the Folkways label, where you covered some wonderful uh, traditional material. Growing up, uh, how much were you were you seeking out those type of sounds? Well, that's what I started out playing, really. You know, because I started playing guitar in '65, um, so that was you know that was really the height of that whole folk movement. Mm-hmm. that was going on back then. So I started out really doing like, you know, the traditional American and English folk songs, you know, that Joan Baez was singing, and yeah. that sort of thing. Pete Seeger, Woody Guthrie, and all of that. And of course, I grew up around Hank Williams and Loretta Lynn. And then I got into the blues, country blues stuff, like Mississippi, John Hurd, and, um, you know, Memphis Minnie and Lightning Hopkins and all that. So... You know, that was the earliest stuff that I started with. Any desire to record another album in that mode again someday? Um, I don't know if I'll do a whole record like that, like Bob Dylan did a few years ago. But mm. who knows? I don't know. It'd, you, be, it'd, it'd probably be kind of fun to do that, you know. <laughs> you, you traveled around quite a bit in, in your younger days. Did this influence the, the musical styles that, that you took in? Oh, yeah, it did, of course, you know, traveling, seeing different things, meeting different kinds of people, learning about different cultures and all of that. I read uh, an early interview with you where you you mentioned that you, at the time, suffered from uh, stage fright from time to time. Through the years, have have you learned to cope with that better as time's passed? Um, Well, a little bit, but I still get really nervous beforehand. I sort of have pre-show anxiety, I guess. Mm. Have you developed a method or a routine of, of perhaps getting over that or developing a, a certain stage confidence? Well, it helps if I have a nice, comfortable place to go to backstage mm-hmm. where I can be by myself and kind of relax and just kind of, you know, chill out and not have a lot of people around talking to me and stuff, you know. But mm-hmm. Some of these clubs that you play, you know, you go backstage and it's like a closet back there, <laughs> you know, and there's all these people are back there crammed in, you know. I'm sure it doesn't help. Um, yeah, so that it makes a difference to sort of have that downtime, you know, by yourself. Yeah. How do you look back on your time with Rough Trade Records now? Because they weren't really a label that, that gained its notoriety with Roots-related music. Did, were you uh-huh. ha- apprehensive about going there originally? No, not at all, because at the time... They were the only label who'd, who had offered me a record deal at all, believe it or not. Back then, um, every other label had passed on me, even some of the other smaller labels, like Rounder Records and High Tone and, you know, all those little labels. Mm-hmm. And, and, of course, all the bigger labels. They didn't know what to do with me, and they didn't think I was very marketable at the time. So when Rough Trade came along, I really didn't have anything else going on, and they they had heard a demo tape that I'd done, and they liked it. Robin Hurley, specifically, he was running the label in the U.S., the U.S. portion of it at the time, and he'd never even seen me perform, and he called me up and asked me if I wanted to make a record, and I said, sure. Was so, it? You know, was- that was it, and the rest is history. And I loved working with them. They were a great label to work with. They were an independent label, but they really put a lot behind me. You know, they sent me over over to Europe to play and and everything. And you know, it was a good uh, good way to start off. Yeah, it, 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 that kind of attitude is rare in a label these days. It I would, really is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was it a frustrating time after the first Rough Trade record and the five years it took till, till the next album? Were, there were um, record companies the problems there, weren't there? Yeah, it, to tell you the truth, I didn't really notice that there was that much time in between because most of that time was spent touring behind the Rough Trade record and then recording the next record. So, um, you know, it didn't really seem that long of a time. And then, of course, looking for another label and stuff. So, you know, there was a lot of stuff to fill up that time, a lot of other things going on. Mm -hmm. Eventually settled in Nashville, which is a a real magnet for songwriters. It just seems to draw them there. What what do you think it is that that attracts people there in such numbers? Well, I think just what you said. You know, there's the country music industry is here, and 
and so there is some industry here, even though it's really, um, you know, relegated to just that sort of straighter country sound. There's a, there also is an alternative music scene here, but there really isn't much of an industry to support it right now. Mm-hmm. You know, and ho- hopefully that'll change. I mean, Steve Earle's got his label here, and um, you know, but there really isn't like a real healthy alternative recording industry here yet, like there is in LA. You know, um, but you know, there's a big songwriting thing here. I mean. The majority of the country artists, you know, re- they don't record, they don't write their own songs. So there's a big market, huge market for country songs. Mm-hmm. So that's what most people come here to try to do. You know, if they can make a, some people can make a living doing that. You know, they just get to, they make appointments to write. You know, they get <laughs> together with other songwriters and they write songs specifically for the country music market you know, targeted for that market yeah, so to try to try to be a hit kind of a thing. It's know? a real industry, is that? Pardon? It's a real industry. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a whole different way of writing songs, you know. So, but then you've got a whole other scene here that's comprised of people like John Prine and Emmylou Harris and Nancy Griffith and Guy Clark and Steve Earle and Steve Forbert and, you know, um... And they're all artists, you know, they're just artists from doing their own thing, you know. So, it's, there's kind of two different worlds here. Have you um, found critics and reviewers over the years? Do you take much notice of what they have to say? Yeah, I do. I mean, I read everything that I can. You know, I probably shouldn't, but <laughs> um, fortunately, most of it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I guess I'm lucky in that respect. I don't recall reading a bad one about you, no. Well, there's there have been a couple. You know, there was this one in Baltimore, at the Baltimore Sun one time. This guy, J.R. Constantine, just tore me apart, you know. <laughs> but all my fans rushed to my rescue. You know, they all just ate him up like piranha. <laughs> you know, you just go on the Internet. They've got all these, you know, on my website. They go in there and... Because they print all the press that comes out, yeah. you know, comes out on my website. So, you know, <laughs> I have such a die-hard following of fans. You know, they're they're so loyal. Must- but this guy was convinced that I wasn't. He couldn't quite believe me. You know, he thought that somehow I was had been educated at Harvard or someplace, and that I actually knew how to sing better than I did. <laughs> but that I was singing this way in order to gain credibility with the alternative roots scene, you know. Yeah. He accused me of singing off key on my whole record, and you know, he kept saying, "Well, she really knows better. She knows how to sing better than this, but she's just doing this on purpose," you know. <laughs> I mean, it was just ridiculous, you know. And he made some stupid comment about. He said, "The Carter family now." You know, they have an excuse. They can sing off key because they don't know any better. <laughs> I mean, it's really patronizing, you know. It's been so some... anyway, but that was the worst one. Yeah. There have been some great covers of your songs over the years. Have any uh, of those covers made, made you rethink how you cover the song yourself? No, not really so far. They've just been pretty different you know mm. just pretty much th- that artist's interpretation of it so you know I don't really think about that kind of stuff too much I like it when other people do my songs it's great you know just I think I get a big kick out of it oh, it must be a great feeling I guess it's the ultimate compliment for a songwriter really oh, isn't it yeah I mean I love the way Tom Petty did Tree to Change the Locks actually that one did make me sort of take notice and I thought wow that's a cool interpretation you know <clears throat> His was probably the closest to to my original. Yeah. You know. Apart from what hopefully would be would be uh, financial benefit from having uh, your your songs covered by others, uh, how else has your career been boosted by some commercially successful covers of your careers? Uh, well, the really the only successful one I've had is that Passionate Kisses one. Mm-hmm. That's it, really. <laughs> I need another one like that. <laughs> 
what would you say is your, your strongest asset as a writer? Um, I don't know. That's a good. It, that's kind of hard for me to answer. I mean, I guess um, it depends on what you're talking about. Are you talking about like lyrically or musically or? Well, either. Yeah. 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 I guess maybe you know the melodies and getting sort of like a hook thing or something in there. You know. Um, and also just writing about what I feel, you know, the honesty and directness, um, and making, having the songs be accessible to a lot of different people. Yep. Is it important yeah. for you to, to road test new songs to an audience to gauge your reaction before deciding which ones to record? Yeah, I did that the other night. I played here in town a couple of nights and I tried out a couple of new songs on people. I think it's really good to do that. How much does the, the audience reaction influence which way you go with a song? Um, it, it influences a lot. I mean, in terms of whether I'm going to put it on the record, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I can usually tell anyway myself. You know, it's usually... They usually react the same way I do. You know, I mean, it's usually an even thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So... Because I usually don't perform them at all until they're really ready. So, um... Would you say you're a harsh judge of your own work? You're pretty self-critical? Yeah. You are? Yeah, I'm really critical anyway, so I don't have to... I don't really... You know, I'm so critical anyway that, you know, <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> but it, it's still a good idea. I like to get the reaction from people. Yeah. You know... As a rule in the past, how have, th have things panned out in the studio for the songs pretty much how you originally envisaged them, or do they change a lot in the recording process? A lot. It depends. They they can really change quite a bit, you know, from the way I wrote them, like the tempos, you know. Because um, a lot of times when I write something, it's sort of kind of folkier, you know, because I'm just sitting down with my acoustic guitar. And then when you go in with a band, it's really... It's really different when you have you know, add bass and drums. Mm -hmm. You know. You in, enjoy the studio environment. Is that is that a comfortable place for you? Um. Yes and no. I mean, I enjoy it, but at the same time, it's hard for me to relax sometimes when I know the tape is rolling. Mm -hmm. You know, but I'm getting better with that. I think it's just a learning process. A lot of that, you know. Now, your last album was simply an outstanding record. It's one of my favourite records of, of the last decade. Do you see it now as a, a satisfying mix of uh, critical acceptance and acceptance in the commercial marketplace as well? Um, do I see it as being accepted by the critics and also in the commercial? Yeah, was it that for you? Did it, did it sell as well as your other albums? Or better uh, than? Yeah, so, uh, well, yeah, better. Yeah. Yeah. This is the most successful record I've ever done. And personally satisfying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, I believe you virtually recorded the album over again. Yeah, I did. What was it about the original recording that wasn't quite right for you? Well, the other one wasn't really finished yet. I mean, it wasn't like we mixed it and all that and then did the whole record over. I mean, we had rough mixes of all the songs and... Um, Really what led me to that decision was Steve Earl invited me to sing on his I Feel All Right album. Mm -hmm. And um, I was so impressed with the way his record sounded at the time. He had his rough mixes and I had mine. And I put them side by side. And I really liked the way his record sounded better than mine. And I said, this is the way I want my record to sound, you know. Um, he had done it with Ray Kennedy in the studio here in Nashville. And so we really, I went in, you know, he said, well, let me work with you on some of these songs, you know. So that's why we went back in, because uh, once I heard his record, I knew, you know, it kind of gave me something to measure mine by. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'm glad I made that, that move, because it wouldn't be the record that it is now if I hadn't done that. True enough, yep. Yeah. We mentioned earlier reviewers and critics. How did you feel when you heard quotes like the blonde on blonde of the 90s being bandied about? <laughs> <laughs> um, just on top of the world. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's a great feeling. Now, you talked about road testing some new songs uh, just before, so I believe, that, would that be possible that there's a new recording on the horizon? Yeah, I'm supposed to turn a new record in by the end of this year. Oh, terrific. Yeah. So, at what stage are we with that? Are the songs ready? Not yet. They're not all ready yet. I'm just, you know, I'm just getting them ready. I'm getting them finished. They're, I haven't even finished writing them all yet. And in terms of musical direction, do you have any idea in mind there? Um, I don't really think about it, really, you know. I'm just writing the songs and just see how it goes. And touring, what, what's the touring situation for you at the moment? Well, I'm probably not actually going to be on the road till about, like, spring of next year. Mm -hmm. Until the record's out. Mm-hmm. We certainly hope you can uh, squeeze in an Australian visit down yeah. in that time. It's been a while. We'd love to see you again. Thank you. I've always had a good time over there. I'm really enjoying Casey Chambers, by the way. Oh, yeah. She's she's yeah, taking she's the place over, by storm down here. Yeah, I bet. She's over here right now. Oh, know, is she? In, in Nashville this week, yeah. Oh, terrific. <clears throat> she did. I invited her to do a Riders in the Round with me Friday night at the Bluebird. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so we did that. It was with uh, Cindy Bullens and Joylyn White and Casey Chambers and myself. Oh, uh, great. How did, how did Casey go down? Pardon? How did Casey go with the audience? That oh, day? she's incredible. I mean, everybody's just blown away. I mean, it's just, she's amazing. Oh, that's fantastic news. She had a great yeah. year down here last year. She really did. That, that's great to hear she's doing yeah, well over there. She's, she's doing real, she's going to really do well, really well. Tremendous. Okay, Lucinda, yeah. uh, it sounds like you've got a busy house full there, so I'll, I'll let you get back to it. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Best of luck with the with the new record, and we, we can't wait to hear it. Thanks a lot. Okay, you take care. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.